So hello everyone, my name is Rohan. I'm a second year master's student at the Department of Computing Science at the University of Alberta. And thank you Alex for the introduction. So this talk is a primer for a talk that will follow this. So the title of my talk is Machines Read, Humans Read and the Parallels Between Computer and Human Representations of Meaning. So how computers understand language and how humans understand language and what's the connection between the two. So what will we talk about? Uh, first, we will talk about high dimensional representations of text. And in that section, we're going to look into word vectors. And then we will look into how we can record the brain and get some idea of how the brain do does something and what it does uh, given under certain conditions. And we will look into types of brain imaging data and after we have a understanding of word vectors and the types of brain imaging data, um, we'll go, we are going to look at decoding and how we can use the two concepts and try to establish a relation between the two. And in the decoding section, we are going to look at how we can use computational models to build an association. And finally, uh, we are going to look at how we can use the decoding model and see its applications in a study. So high dimensional representations of text. So in a computer uh, at a very low level, the, we can represent information only in a binary format. And if you give a text to a computer and ask it to perform any kind of you know, operation, usually mathematical operations, uh, it will go haywire and we don't want that. So what we do is we transform the text into some kind of numeric representation. Usually it's a list of numbers. And how we do this is we generally use some kind of database or any collection of text and use that to extract some information so that we can assign some kind of unique identifier or value to each of the tokens in the uh, corpus. And each token can be represented or can be anything. It can be a fundamental unit of uh, the corpus. So a word, a sentence, a document, or something like that. One example of uh, transforming text into a numeric representation would be counting the number of times a word occurs in a document. So this is known as the frequency count matrix. So here are two examples and two sentence where sentence one says the rat ate the cheese, sentence two says the cat ate the rat and ate the cheese. And the vocabulary is um, the rat, cat, ate and cheese. And we can simply see that uh, the frequency matrix um, shows the count of each of the words that occurs in each of the sentences. And so here in this example, the word the, the, occurs two times in the first sentence here and here and occurs three times in the second sentence. And the is the same for the rest of the words. And it's like clearly observed that if we increase the number of sentences, uh, we will also have another value uh, right underneath this three, one and all the other numbers. So as the number of sentences increase, the dimensions or the number of values of each of the words also increase. And I also want to like talk about the vector space model, which is um, which is an idea that can be extended from the frequency count matrix. So what we have here is a projection of all the words. We have some example words here and each of those words is being projected into a three dimensional space in this case, but it can be projected into any n-dimensional space. Obviously humans can only visualize uh, 3D space and it's like gets difficult if we try to visualize high dimensions. Uh, but just to give you an overview how we can use that idea of counts or frequency and try to visualize and get an understanding of how these words actually are present in a ND space. So we have uh, goose, eagle, bee, helicopter, drone, and rocket. And we can use the information or what we learned from the previous slide to uh, 
build some kind of vector. And we have helicopter here and it has a, let's say an X value of zero, Y value of two and Z value of four. And we can also see that each axis represents some characteristic or some feature of that specific or of that specific word. So helicopter, it doesn't have wings, therefore it has a value of zero. Uh, it has an engine and it can also, it also flies in the sky. Same with eagle and rocket. And this is an important concept because we can try to find how close two points are in space. And why is it important? It actually takes us to, or tries to um, give an idea of how humans also think of similar words. So for example, if I ask someone, can you give me a word that is similar to the word orange? Most people would say apple is a similar word to orange, but how did that person come up with the word apple? There is some representation in the brain that tells that person, okay, apple is similar to the word orange. Maybe that person uses the concepts of um, shape, uh, size, uh, color is slightly different and also the generalized category of fruit and use uses those, those information to you know come up with the word apple similarly uh, we can like find out okay helicopter is similar to drone because they lie in somewhat similar uh, vicinity in the n dimensional space so that we can you know um, calculate if the words are closer to each other than any other pair of words. And it also incorporates semantic, distributed semantic information. As I said, like each of the dimensions can be thought of as some characteristic for that specific particular word. So wings, engine, or sky. And I also mentioned that it's an important idea because it helps us to compute the similarity between words. So I also want to like talk about word to vec which is slightly different. In fact, very different from the frequency count matrix. It also preserves the semantic relation among words in any kind of corpus. So word to vec is a shallow neural network. Uh, it does require a bit of understanding of how a neural network works. But at a very high level, it has two basic parts, two algorithms. One is called the SIBO or continuous bag of words. So what it does, it, it takes a set of words. I actually have an example here. So it takes, let's say in this example, uh, the words Joe ate the, it doesn't take in banana. And it also takes in which was yellow. And it gives you a representation of the word banana. But in case of a skip gram, which this example is actually related to, it takes in the word banana and gives you a probability distribution of the possible words that the word banana can occur with. So it gives you like many probability values for uh, almost all the words in the corpus that the banana is present in. Okay, and this is one of the powerful models. It is published in 2013 as one of the powerful models and is very prevalent in any kind of NLP task. Okay, so now we have an understanding of why do we need to transform any kind of text into a numeric representation. And we also looked at the motivation for that. So let's look at how we can uh, record the brain and try to understand what the brain is doing given a certain task. So in case of language processing and how we can somehow get some data to look at how the brain is doing things, we use methods, some methods to capture the brain or record the brain. So one of the methods is EEG or electroencephalography. And in EEG, the participants are asked to wear an EEG cap and there are like small electrodes uh, it's non-invasive, so you only wear a cap on your head. You There is no surgery involved. And there are many electrodes, and those electrodes record the electric currents or the electric fields generated by the electric currents that happen to take place inside the brain. Uh, 
The second one is fMRI or functional magnetic resonance imaging. Um, it's usually how it works is the participants are asked to uh, stay still and the fMRI, there's an fMRI, fMRI scanner and what it does is it tries to map the oxygenation level uh, at different points of different points of uh, different points in time when the participant is actually doing something. And the one that I'm going to focus on is MEG or magnetoencephalography. And I'm going to only focus on this because the case study or the paper that I'm going to discuss only uses this technique to record the brain. And also the talk that will follow this also uses MEG. Okay, so let's talk about MEG. So MEG literally means a magnetic image of the brain. And the way it works is our brain produces electrical currents so that it can communicate between different parts of the body. And from electromagnetism, we know that each electric current is associated with a perpendicular magnetic field. And the MEG device tries to capture those magnetic changes or the changes in the magnetic field produced by the electric currents. It's super sensitive. And obviously our, the electric currents generated in our brain are at a, are of a very low magnitude. And so device has to be very sensitive to minute changes in the magnetic field. It's usually combined with an FM MRI to have a structural understanding of what parts of the brain are actually uh, creating those changes in the magnetic field. So how is one part of the brain different from another part of the brain when the participant is performing any task? When compared to EEG, it has less attachments, obviously. Um, in EEG, you have a cap where that cap is solely responsible for recording the electric fields. But in case of an MEG, you have a bigger device. I'll just show you a picture. So you have a bigger device. You wear a small cap, which just gives the device the locations of where the sensors are. But the magnetic fields are recorded by this device itself. So you sit here or any participant sits here and they place their head somewhere around here. And this device captures the changes in the magnetic field. And this is an example of how an MEG recording looks like. And this is like, um, usually the participant is facing this way, the left ear is this way and the right ear is this way. So let's go over some of the um, pros and cons of MEG. So MEG has excellent temporal resolution like EEG. And what I mean by temporal resolution is you can record um, the brain in almost real time. So you, can, you are continuously getting data as the participant is doing something or performing the task. And EEG is also, also gives you like data in real time. So it's very quick. And uh, there are some differences between EEG and MEG which I'm, which I'm going to talk about in a moment. Unlike fMRI, when we compare MEG to fMRI, the participants cannot or are discouraged to move in an fMRI because if they move, uh, the uh, fMRI images that we get, they get distorted and they have to like stay very still so that we can get an accurate representation of what is actually happening. But in MEG, the participants are free to move their head around. And this is one of the reasons um, babies can also be studied and how their brain you know, processes information because they are like very active, they move their head around a lot. So MEG is one of the go-to methods when we, MEG or EEG is one of the go-to methods when we try to record data from babies. It has better spatial resolution than EEG. And what I mean by spatial resolution is in MEG, you are able to, um, get a more accurate understanding of where the signal uh, is actually, where the changes in magnetic field are actually happening. And EEG, you can also do that, but the precision is not as good at, as MEG. And fMRI has the best precision. So there is a trade-off between EEG and MEG and fMRI. And the reason for this is because the EEG, the electric fields actually get distorted because of the skull but uh, magnetic uh, 
fields do not have the same amount of interference. One of the cons of MEG is that the MEG devices are expensive. So you do need a lot of money to, uh, to actually have an MEG device. But in case of an EEG, they are fairly cheaper. Um, one of the problems, or not the problem, but it's something that you need to be careful of when you're trying to record um, the brain using MEG is that you need a magnetically shielded room. As I said, like these magnetic fields are in very at a very low magnitude, and the Earth's magnetic field can cause interference uh, when you actually record the brain. So it can like sneak its way into the actual recording. So you need a magnetically shielded room to um, just block out the Earth's magnetic field. And as I said, uh, it this point follows from the third point, which uh, compares MEG and fMRI, where fMRI is the best for localizing activity in the brain. MEG is also better than EEG, and, but it can only give you like somewhat of a surface level idea of where the activity is actually taking place. Okay, so now we have an understanding of why uh, we need to transform text into word vectors. So we learned about the high dimensional representation of text. We also learned about how we can record the brain. And now we will use these two concepts and move on to decoding, uh, where we actually establish and connect the two components. So decoding is simply a process of associating the brain imaging data with any kind of stimuli. In this case, it's a language, but it can be images or let's say auditory signals that the participants hear. And language stimuli is represented by word vector in any decoding task. And this is because like word vectors are a good approximation of word meanings. And the way we establish the association between the brain imaging data and the word vectors are using uh, computational models. So we use computational models to like create a connection between the two. And this is like a visual uh, picture of how uh, the process or the pipeline actually looks like. So we have the brain imaging data on the left and it can be from any source, fMRI, MEG or EEG. And we have the word vectors on the right. And so just to clarify that word vectors can also contain real numbers. In this case, it's, it has six dimensions and each cell contains one real number, but it can be extended to 100, 200 or 300 dimensions. Word to vec actually gives you embeddings of dimension 300. And the decoding task is to create an association between the two. And how do we do that is we feed in the brain data and out comes the word vectors. And the reason for this is that um, we are not able to understand directly what the brain is doing given any um, task. At least we cannot uh, directly by just looking at the activation patterns. Okay, this is what the brain is doing and this is where it's happening. Maybe we can also localize just by looking at the brain imaging data, but it's very hard to look into the explainability or the interpretability of what the brain is actually doing. And since we understand how a computational model works, we can exploit that information and uh, use it to leverage the understanding of what the brain is doing. When in this case, it's, uh, we take an example of a language processing task. And so we can like exploit the computational model and understand how the model is working and what is what it's actually doing when it uh, tries to take in the brain imaging data and uh, give the word vectors as output. So let's look at the model. So the model is usually a machine learning algorithm that takes the brain imaging data as input and predicts the word vectors. And as I said, we don't know how the brain uh, does things when it's sub uh, when it's actually trying to process any kind of information. So we can like use the understanding of the model to uh, 
help understand what the brain is doing. And this is, uh, this might be somewhat um, getting ahead of myself, but just to give you an overview how the model is made sure that it is appropriate for the task is we train on a subset of data. In this case, it's a brain data and we test on a different subset of data, but the distribution that the data is actually taken from is the same. So during the testing phase, we know how, how we can assess the performance of the model because we want the model to be you know, you know good so that it can be used to on new data as well because we don't have unlimited data and we want that the uh, model is performing well and generalizing on new data. Okay, so this is one ridge regression is one of the um, types of models that is used in any kind of decoding application, especially uh, when connecting brain imaging data and word vectors. And so I'm going to just talk, take some time to talk about um, ridge regression. So it's linear regression. Um, linear regression, if you don't know what it is, it's just the equation of a line, so y equals mx plus c. And the L2 regularization is just a way to make sure that the model is generalizing well on new data because we only have limited amount of data and our recording brain is expensive. So we need to make sure that our model is performing well when it's actually being used by uh, any kind of industrial application. So here's an example of how we can use the ridge regression model to um, connect the brain imaging data and the word vectors. So on the left, we have the brain data and usually, usually it's averaged because brain data is noisy more in most of the cases and we want to remove the noise as much as possible. So what we do is usually the averaging process is um, done on a trial by trial basis. And so let's say we um, ask the participants to you know, perform certain tasks and we repeat the tasks so that we can average those specific trials only for specific tasks. And what we do is we then uh, take the training data we, it's a subset of the uh, overall data set. And we feed that into a machine learning model. In this case, it's a linear regression with some penalty term, which I also call it as a regularization term. So you see that this equation is very similar to the um, equation of a line. So W here is, is some kind of transformation that we applied to the input, that is the brain imaging, brain imaging data, and we get the output, which is the word vectors. So X here is the brain imaging data. We multiply uh, the brain imaging data with W, and we get the Y as output, which is the word vector. And as I said, regularization is just a way to make sure that it, the model generalizes well on new data. And this process is called the training process. I think I'm getting more into the machine learning side of the decoding pipeline, but I think it's important to understand how it works. And while we, um, while we are training and we finish the training, and now we want to make, uh, want to understand how the model uh, has learned it or how well can the model perform on new data, what we do is we go to a testing phase and we take the test data, which is also from the same distribution of the brain imaging data or of the overall brain imaging data. And we multiply that with the learned uh, transformation matrix during the training process. And we then predict the word vectors. And so all these components are encapsulated in a framework called the prediction framework. And this is a uh, visual understanding or an example which can help you uh, get a visual understanding of how um, these predictions are actually made and how they can be visualized in any dimensions. In this case, there are like two dimensions and the first axis, as I mentioned, 
earlier in the talk can be thought of as one of the characteristics of each of the objects. And this can be another characteristic. So in this case, we have like the training data where the samples correspond to, or the brain driven data correspond to uh, the words cat or horse, egg, apple, and desk. And during the testing phase, the model only has access to the brain imaging data, but not the word vectors. During the training process, it needs the brain imaging data and the word vectors so that it can learn the connection between the two and ultimately find a good enough W that we talked about in the earlier slide. But in case of the testing process or the testing phase, um, the model only has access to the brain imaging data and not the word vectors. But we have the person who is actually coding up the model does have access to that, but the model doesn't know what the true word vectors are. So it cannot use that information to make some predictions. And when the model does make the prediction, it can be also thought of, be thought of as being projected into some area or some point in the space. And then we try to find how close the predictions are to their you know, true values in this case. and in this case. And here's uh, one like uh, last slide just to touch upon, just going into a bit more detail on how the regression model works. So we have like the brain imaging data in, in the form of a matrix. And we want to learn W as I said before, and we want to predict the word vectors. So each dimension of the word vector or each cell does contain a value, a real numbered value. And the W can be thought of as a collection of many independent weight matrices. And so we, these are represented by beta in this case. So we take beta one and apply the transformation beta one on the input data, um, which is the brain imaging data and get the first dimension or the value of the first dimension of the word vector. We do the same thing with beta two and beta three and beta four and beta five and so on. And the number of uh, dimensions that the word vector has is also equal to the number of um, individual weight matrices that the overall or the global weight matrix W has. And this at the bottom is an equation just to give you an, give you an overview of how the a good enough W is actually found. So it might be hard to understand if uh, the, um, like this is new to you, but what it says in general is SIK is a, a true to a true value of any word vector. And this is the prediction. And we want to find a beta such that we minimize this difference. And this is again the regularization term that I talked about earlier for the model to generalize, you know, well for on new data. And the idea is we need to, we want to minimize this difference so that we find a good enough beta for each of the dimensions of the word vectors. And there's the minimizing um, argument. And this is just a compact representation of this equation. Okay, so now that we have an understanding of um, the uh, regression model and how it works, how it can be applied to you know, predict the word vectors from the brain imaging data, we need a way to assess the performance of how good our model uh, has actually learned from the training data, how good our model is. So there is a technique called the two versus two test. And in this test, we compare the closeness of the predictions to the true values. And this is done after we have obtained the predictions during the testing phase. So after the testing phase is completed, we go on to assessing the model performance or the decoding performance. Okay, so let's look at it at, uh, from a visual perspective. So let's imagine there are two axes. This can be any, it can represent anything, literally any kind of uh, feature. Um, or any kind of characteristic of the object. And we have, let's say one true value. We also have another true value. We only consider like two samples during the two versus two test. So we only consider like 
to true values and also to true two two predictions which we then compare to the true values so x1 and x2 always represent the brain imaging data and we get the predictions by multiplying the input with the transformation that we learned during the training process and we somehow get the representation uh, in the 2D space in this case, which are like the predictions. So in this case, the predictions seem to be close to the true values, but how can we actually measure how close they are? So the two versus two test works as follows. First, we calculate the similarity, not the distance. We can also use distance, but in this case, I'm going to talk about similarity between true one and prediction one and then also calculate the similarity between true two and prediction two and also calculate the similarity between the opposite pairs so true one and prediction two and true two and prediction one and the two versus two test passes if the summation of the similarities between the correctly matched pairs is less than the summation of the similarities between the incorrectly matched pairs. And just to repeat that the model does not know the these true one and true two values, it only has the input data. So we, you can see here that the prediction is made only based on the input data and the transformation matrix learned during the training process. So it cannot use this information to you know actually make the predictions. So one uh, important characteristic of the two versus two test is that the chance accuracy is 50%. So if there is no relation between the brain imaging data and the word vectors, and you run the two versus two test on the data, um, you will get an accuracy of 50%. So it's called the two versus two accuracy. So just to give you an example of that, um, these can be, if there is no relation between the input and the output, uh, you can expect some the predictions to be somewhere uh, like this in the n-dimensional space or maybe um, somewhere like this. So there is no reason to believe that there will be any pattern in the n-dimensional space. It's totally random. And this also makes us think about how good our two versus two accuracy is. So for that, we use the permutation test. And this is another concept where it's just an extension to the idea of there can or cannot be any relation between the input and the output. So I talked about in the previous slide that if there is no relation between the input and the output, you are expecting a accuracy of 50%. So the permutation test actually recreates that scenario where um, there is no relation between the input and the output. And if we see that the permutation test gives an accuracy of 50% and the non-permutation test with the correctly matched labels um, gives us an accuracy of um, greater than 50%, we can say that, okay, our results are significant. So it's a way to measure the significance of results. So the way it works is we have the data and we shuffle the data. So now that the target labels are incorrectly matched to the brain imaging data. And then we take this shuffled data and feed it into a prediction framework. And this in a way creates a null distribution. And as I said, the performance should be 50% because the data is randomly shuffled for the reasons that I discussed in the earlier slide, that in a sense, it creates no relation or it like distorts the relation between the input and the output, if there is any. Rohan, uh, may I interrupt you with a short question? Yes. Um, what are the labels uh, in this example with the um, word vectors and the brain imaging data? So the labels are the word vectors. So uh -huh. um, I would say, for example, if the if any participant is looking at a word, let's say, um, hello. So we have a word vector representation for the word hello that we can actually put in a computer. So that item has a label. Mm 
I see. And the uh, 50% that uh, you say we might expect under this no randomly shuffled distribution, um, wouldn't that depend on the frequency maybe of that label or, or something in the data set? So what do you mean by frequency of the label? Um, let's imagine a very pathological cooked up scenario where maybe all but one of the data points in your data set have the same label, um, label one, and then only one point has a different label. And like, let's say we shuffle those labels and now we try to predict the label of a point. I think we're quite likely to predict the label correctly, um, maybe. Yeah, so I think you're getting at the um, how what the ratio of some kind of labels are, or is there like a disproportionate ratio of some labels to the others? Is that what you're talking about? Yes, and if you think that that might impact our expectation uh, from what we might see uh, from the permutation test. Yes, so that's definitely possible. And in any kind of machine learning task, we make sure that there is an equal proportion of all the labels that are considered for the experiment. So this is a problem that will arise if during the training process, we don't make sure that we have an equal number of um, classes that we want to actually, you know, predict. Is okay. this for the two versus two test, Rohan? Um, this is not the two versus two test. The two versus two test is in general. In general, yes. In general, any machine learning problem, we want to make sure that, uh, let's say there are 10 classes. We don't want like 70% uh, of the classes are like uh, from one to eight and only rest of the classes are, um, the rest 30% uh, of the classes are from like uh, nine and 10. So we don't want that. We want like an equal distribution of all the samples. Maybe I can jump in here and just point out a couple of things that um, the two versus two test requires that the two words you're choosing between be different. So the two versus two test has a degenerate case where if the two test words are the same word, then you can't do the two versus two test. So you would have to have two different examples um, to do the two versus two test. And then maybe your original question is something to do with the, the permutation test. If you have too many of one particular label, when you permute the labels, most of the, most of the elements will still have the correct label. Is that what you were getting at, Alex? Uh, I think so, yes. And why 50%? Uh, yeah, more specifically, why 50%? So the 50% comes from choosing between two values. So here, if mm. there, there's no reason to think S1, S2 will be smaller or larger than D1 plus D2, there's no reason to think that just by random chance, D, S1, S2 will be smaller than D1, D2 if, if the points are, are randomly distributed in space. And so because true one and true two do have to be two different words, um, even if the two predictions, prediction one and prediction two, maybe that model really likes to predict things that are really similar to tr the one label you see the most, the, tr the two versus two test is still gonna have the same choosing between two points. There's no reason that one of those values should be any closer than the other. I see, now it's clearer, thank you. Okay, and I should also say that in most of, I think, well, the data is evenly distributed across the labels for the, all the data we'll talk about today. Thank you. Um, one more quick question. Uh, the, uh, the word, the, the vector encoding or embedding of the words that you use in your application, what, what is it? Um, so it's not word to work. It's from a different study or, diff or from a different paper that was published in 2012. It's not worth to work, but I think a Dr. Alona Fish is actually Dr. Alona Fish's study and how she created the word embeddings or the word vectors. So maybe she could give you like a better and comprehensive understanding of how the word vectors for each of the words were actually created, but it's not from a neural network model that I can say for sure. Okay. Yeah, so the, the, the word vectors for the case study Rohan will talk about today are built from like a word co-occurrence matrix. Um, like at a very high level with some additional stuff in, incorporated. And then the word vectors that I'll talk about in my talk are the word to vec skipgram vectors. Great, thanks. Okay, so we talked about the permutation test and it gives a way to 
measure the significance of the two versus two test. So now that uh, we have looked at the word vectors, uh, how we can record the brain and the decoding pipeline, let's move on to the case study where the decoding pipeline is actually implemented. So the paper that I'm going to discuss is Dr. Fisher's work. It was published in 2019 and the title is The Lexical Semantics of Ejective Noun Phrases in the Human Brain. So in this paper, the task is to establish a relationship between the stimulus and the image data. So it's a general decoding task. And the stimulus in this case are adjective and noun phrases. So there are like two words, which I'll discuss in detail. One of them is adjective and the other one is noun. And one of the contributions in this paper was to, or one of the um, investigations was to track the neural representations of single words adjectives and nouns over time. And one other uh, thing that was also mentioned in the uh, paper was uh, the regression model is also able to, so the paper did use the regression model that I discussed earlier and it, the model is able to like localize the neural representations of words and uh, which part of the brain actually is activated when the participant actually uh, looks at the stimuli. So here's the paradigm and how the experiment was uh, set up. So the words were shown for 500 milliseconds and there, were, there was a 300 millisecond interval between any two words. And, uh, and between any two phrases, there was a three second gap. And this was repeated for all the pairs of words. So there were like 30 pairs of words, 30 words in the study. And there were many pairs created from those 30 words. And so here's an example. So an adjective would be tasty and then a 300 millisecond interval and then tomato for 500 milliseconds and then a 300 millisecond gap and then a three second gap. Okay, so let's talk about the pipeline and uh, how from the beginning of the data collection till the end of the uh, analysis or we, the two versus two test. So on the left, we have a participant looking at some text. So they look at the raw words like tasty and tomato. They don't look at the word vectors. The word vectors is only for the machine learning model. And then we collect the brain data. In this case, it's MEG. And then we feed the MEG data into the prediction framework. And then we have the predicted word vectors and also the true word vectors. And we can see that there is no connection between the true word vectors with the prediction framework during the testing phase. And so it's in a different block setting, setting by itself. And this is where the analysis is done or the two versus two test is done. But what is the task that the paper actually uh, looks into? So there are a couple of tasks. The first task is to uh, check whether we can predict the adjective that the participant is actually looking at or predict the stimuli from the brain imaging data. So predict the identity of the first word in a phrase, which is an adjective. And also the same with the second word in the phrase, which is a noun. And then we assign the adjective based on the predictions that we obtain from the model. And so let's look at the results now. So the first observation that we can actually look from this graph or observe is that during the adjective presentation to the participants, the accuracy, the two versus two accuracy of the ridge regression model is really high. So, okay, we can predict the adjective from the brain imaging data. And the same is also for the noun. But two interesting things that really stand out from this graph are during the noun presentation, during the time the participants actually see the noun, we can also predict the adjectives with a fairly decent accuracy. And the small circles that you see here represent that the accuracy is above chance, so they are significant. And also this small cluster of above chance accuracies at around two seconds that we observe and this is important because long after the adjective 
is um, the offset of the objective long after the offset of the objective we can still predict the adjectives with a fairly uh, decent amount of accuracy so these are these are the very two interesting observations from this graph apart from the fact that ridge regression performs well in uh, decoding the stimuli from the brain imaging MEG data okay so now we have discussed word vectors um, recording the brain the decoding pipeline and also we looked at the case study so let's look at the takeaways that we got from this presentation so word vectors represent semantics of words and they have been around in the uh, nlp domain for a very long period of time and they are like the go-to um, representations when we want to when we want to like somehow have a numeric uh, representation of any kind of word and they help us to create a connection between human understanding of language and the computer understanding of language as we also saw from the paper and we also saw that MEG is a robust technique for collecting brain imaging data and is also useful to study semantic representation in any kind of human brain. And also we looked at ridge regression, which is one of the computational models that is able to associate brain images with uh, word vectors. And also it helps us to track semantic representation in the brain as we saw from the um, graph from the case study. And we also looked at why two versus two test is a simple, but yet a powerful technique to assess model performance. And so with that, I conclude the presentation. And I guess, and I also have some resources at the end if you're like more interested in looking into um, uh, any kind of studies that you might be interested in or any information. And this is a, this is the paper that Dr. Fish actually took the word vectors from. It's a study, so you might want to check this out. Uh, so this is a using what Ro, the framework that Rohan had talked about today. I'm going to talk about um, a new idea uh, for decoding. So the de the work that Rohan talked about and the typical decoding work um, is often done with uh, reading or listening to work, to language. So in reading, there's been work showing that we can do decoding for single words as well as phrases, which is what Rohan talked about, as well as full stories. Um, so uh, Lalo had they did um, had people read uh, chapter nine, I think, of Harry Potter in the in an fMRI scanner, and then show that you could also decode language meaning from that data. Uh, there's also been work showing that you can dec do decoding when people are listening to language. And uh, Alex Huth had, um, had people listen to the Moth podcast in fMRI scanner, and also showed that he could tell which parts of the podcast you were listening to at particular points in time, using the same sorts of decoding frameworks. Um, but today I'm going to talk about uh, whether or not we can do this decoding of semantics of word meaning, even if there's no linguistic stimuli visible uh, in the environment at all, and you're just planning to say something. So here's a picture of me planning to say something at a talk in 2018, back when you could go places to give talks. Um, this is in Boston. Um, here I am planning a word. And so the question is, as I'm a planning to say a particular word at a particular point in time, can we see that representation in my mind, even though that, that word does not exist in my environment? And so there's some questions that follow on from this. Um, you might recall from the work that Rohan just showed you that there's a very strong peak of uh, decoding accuracy that follows the, uh, the onset of the word. So when the adjective hits the screen very soon after that, we can see the representation for the adjective in a person's brain. Um, so if the words are being planned and they don't exist in your environment, so how do they show up in the neural signature? Are they intermingled? Do, does one follow the other? What's sort of the ordering of the planning? Uh, can we detect uh, the words as they're being planned? How are they uh, existing in the brain at those points in time? And also, we're also going to explore whether the process of planning to make, uh, to say a phrase is any different than planning to say a single word. So this is work uh, in conjunction with uh, four of my colleagues. Marion was my uh, master's student at the University of Victoria. Bria is currently my postdoc now that I'm at the University of Alberta. And uh, Esty was a PhD student of Lena Pilkanen at NYU, um, 
but has now moved on to do a postdoc. She also won recently the top 30 under 30 science people on Forbes, which I'm sure she, they'll be very in, uh, embarrassed that I mentioned just now. <laughs> okay, so in general, uh, this is the framework that, uh, the same framework that Rohan was talking about. So we have some brain imaging data. Here it's collected while people are planning to say a word. We'll split it into training and testing. We'll do the same process of creating a, a, regular, a regularized regression model and using that regression model to predict the dimensions of the word vector. So exactly the same as previously, just that the data source has changed. And I use SkipGram in this work, which is, uh, as Rohan described, a neural network trained to predict nearby words as a function of a central word. So here, if the central word is banana, we might want to predict with high probability that we would probably see the words like eight or yellow around um, that word. Uh, so we when we train a model that can do that task, given a central word, predict the context words, uh, we end up with word vectors uh, that actually um, perform quite well in a lot of uh, uh, word similarity tasks. And the particular model we'll use today was trained on Google News, uh, like a billion words of uh, news articles. So this is how I visualize these models. So there's some brain imaging data that comes in. We usually average across uh, repetitions of a particular stimuli. Uh, and we train a whole bunch of beta weights. And when we apply those beta weights to the brain imaging data, we get predicted vector space model dimensions. Um, and so I think of the, that particular vector as being as predicting a point in space. And we would like for that predicted point in space to be closer to the true word vector for the word the brain imaging data was taken of than to other word vectors. And just like Rohan talked about, I will also be using the two versus two tests where we have, um, we are aware of the true word vectors for the two held out examples, but we're not aware of the uh, assignment of true um, word vectors to what word they are. So we have our predicted uh, word vectors based on the brain imaging data and the true word vectors uh, from the corpus. And we would like to choose the assignment that minimizes the distance. So we're choosing between, for example, here the red lines versus the green lines. Um, there's no reason to believe that the red lines should be shorter than the green lines if there's no connection between the data and the actual words. So chance is 50% because you're choosing between two possible options, either the green arrows or the red arrows. So this data uh, is MEG data. Um, it was collected uh, for 20 participants and they're doing a picture naming task. Uh, it was actually collected as part of a larger study to look at the representation. Um, so not the representations, but the, uh, the sort of brain response to doing uh, sign language versus uh, spoken language. Uh, so that's an interesting paper and, and that's SD's work and you can uh, look that up. So this is the data set from that study. Um, it's only the English speaking people though, not the people doing signing. So they, there was 20 participants for this part of the study and they're doing a picture naming task. The pictures are like I'm showing on the screen here. Oh, do I have a, oh, I do have a cursor. So here's a white lamp on a, a green background and here's a red airplane on a green background. So there's five different uh, objects. So there's lamps and airplanes and so on and so forth. There's five different colors. Um, the backgrounds don't have to be green even though both of these backgrounds are green. There's five possible background colors and five possible foreground colors. And those are mixed in a way that's counterbalanced, properly counterbalanced to create 50 total unique stimuli. Um, so different uh, combinations of foreground color, uh, object and background color. And so this is how we're getting around the fact that we need people to be preparing to say a particular word or phrase, but we don't want to show them the actual word or phrase. So the way that this works is they're going to see this picture and they're going to do a naming task based on that picture. And so there's four conditions in this experiment. Um, these experiments, this experiment is, um, the four conditions are phrase, list, and two isolation conditions where the people just say the noun or the adjective. And so I'll walk through them. So in each case here, I'm showing the same image and I'll tell you what a person would say for each one of these, for this image in each one of the conditions. But of course the images are different. There's 50 unique images that they see and they see exactly the same images in each one of the conditions, which is a sort of a neat control. So even though 
so there is a stimuli that exists in the environment, but it's exactly the same for the, these four conditions. There's no difference in the stimuli. The only difference is that the person in a particular part of the experiment is told that they are to say the phrase, the list, or to just say the noun, or just to say the adjective. So I'll explain each one. So phrase, um, they are to say the color of the object and then the identity of the object. So here, this would be a white lamp. Now, list is sort of the, the interesting condition in that it's a little, um, it's out of what I would say is typical for a picture naming paradigm. So here we are supposed to say the background color, green, and then the identity of the object, lamp. So this, the correct utterance would be green lamp. And then the isolation noun, we say the identity of the object, lamp. Isolation adjective, we say the identity of, the, sorry, the color of the object, white. So in only one of these cases is the uh, utterance that's being planned compositional. So white lamp, the white is actually the color of the lamp. And so that's considered compositional green lamp because the green is um, not associated with the object. It's not considered to be compositional. And then of course, uh, the noun by itself and the adjective by itself are not, are, can't be compositional because they're by themselves. There's two words in a phrase and list condition and only one word in the isolation conditions. And um, in three of the four conditions, you say the adjective first. So in the phrase, the list, and the isolation adjective condition, the first word you're about to say is the adjective. The only condition where you say the noun first is when the noun is said in isolation. And so this will be important because towards the end of the trials, we'll talk about the person is about to say a word. And so the different, there is a difference between the identity of the word they're about to say um, across the conditions. So this is what the trial looks like. So at zero milliseconds, when I show you a time axis along the x-axis, zero milliseconds is the onset of the image. And people on average say the, um, the, the phrase or word they're supposed to utter at about 750 milliseconds. So that's the average onset of speech. So the questions that we can ask here are, um, can we see the adjective and noun representation even though you're planning to say it? You're, there's no stimuli in the environment that's making you, um, that's causing you to think of the word. Uh, sorry, I should say there's no word stimuli in the environment, no language stimuli. Um, so can we decode the identity of the adjective and the identity of the noun? And if so, when? And are there significant differences between our ability to see the word type or um, is there differences as a, um, effect of the context or the condition that you see the image in. So the first thing we'll talk about is when we can see the adjective and noun. So we'll go through each one of the three conditions one at a time. Uh, so the first condition is the phrase condition. So the person sees this picture and they're to say the color of the object and the identity of the object. So here, white lamp. And so um, along the the bottom here are these little dots. These little dots tell us when the corresponding line above it is above chance. So here, this is when this uh, noun line, which is like a burgundy color, is above chance. And here, there's a few points at the, towards the end of the trial where the adjective, which is a navy color, is a, are above chance. And so for now, I'll ask you just to ignore the shading. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, so we can see that early on in time, the signature is really devoted to the noun. So even though you are planning to say a phrase that includes both, both an adjective and a noun, early on between 100 and 400 milliseconds, the, the signal is devoted to uh, representing the noun. Or I should, have seized, I should have say at least what we can measure using the model assumptions we have right now and the, and the paradigm and the technology we're using to measure the brain imaging data, what we can see is the noun. Uh, and uh, sorry to interrupt along, but that uh, should be surprising, right? Because the phrase starts with the adjective. Yeah, so um, yeah, going into this, I'm not, I'm not sure I had hypotheses about what would um, be the thing you would think of sort of most predominantly at first. Um, but we will see that um, here, as you're about to say a particular word, the representation, our ability to, to detect that word identity ramps up. So here we are able to see the adjective as you prepare to say, say the adjective. We're able to see the adjective. But early on in time, the, the representation is really devoted to the noun. Mm -hmm. uh, good, other questions? I think that's all for now. Good, okay. Um, okay, so the next, 
sorry. The next slide, sorry, this isn't going for it. Um, the next uh, condition is the list condition. So here they're seeing the image and they just say the color of the background followed by the identity of the object. So here this would be a green lamp. And so here we see um, a fairly similar pattern for the noun. The noun is above chance early in time between 100 and 400 milliseconds. Um, but we also, and we see the adjective ramps up towards the end when you're about to say the adjective. But you also see this interesting bump for the adjective early in time. Um, and we think this might be partially because this is somewhat uh, a somewhat artificial condition. You have to really um, sort of pay attention in order to say that background color um, instead of the object color. So it's sort of a, a bit of an additional cognitive task to say the background color. And so we think that might be part of why we're seeing this early bump that has to do with the adjective. Um, and as we'll see as we go through the different conditions, this is the only time we can detect the adjective this early. Uh, in a trial. This is interesting to think about because, again, the, the, pa the paradigm is such that the stimuli are exactly the same. If people are seeing exactly the same images in each one of the phrase in the list condition, the only thing that is different is the way that they're attending to the, the stimuli, the way that they're thinking about the stimuli and the phrase or a uh, sequence of words they're about to say. Um, so I think this is a really neat setup that Lena and Esty came up with. Um, and it really sort of allows you to see that we are able to detect things happening in the brain that aren't just a function of the stimuli by itself. If this was just a function of the stimuli and had nothing to do with what the person was actually doing, there would be no differences between the different conditions. But as we'll see in a, in a minute, there are differences. Okay, and the last condition is the isolation condition. So here they see the, um, the picture and they're to say in the noun condition, the identity of the object and the adjective condition, the color of the object. And so, uh, we say again see an early bump for the noun and then uh, the noun actually is above chance all the way from about 325 milliseconds all the way to the end of the trial and the adjective um, has the same sort of similar no early above chance accuracy but it sort of starts up at about 450 so this is a little earlier than uh, in the other two conditions it ramps up as you uh, prepare to say the word Um, so in order to tell the difference between, if there's a significant difference between the conditions or between the different, um, if there's an effect of uh, the word you're about to say, adjective or noun, or an effect of the context you see the word in, the condition you see the, the you're to say the word in, um, we did a two by three ANOVA, and that's actually what these shaded regions that I told you to ignore are indicating. Uh, so the blue is a context effect, which means that the effect is one from uh, the sort of uh, thing you're supposed to say, uh, whether it's a phrase or a list or isolation. And so we see this early effect, um, we think driven by this uh, adjective, uh, this effect of, of the list condition on the adjective probably because we see such a strong um, peak here. We, we think that's why we see this um, early uh, effect of context. And then there's also a late effects of effect of context, probably due to the fact that when you say the words in isolation, there's a really strong ramping up of both adjective and noun um, towards the end of the trial. And then we see a difference of the word category. So that is, there's a difference between um, our ability to, to detect the noun versus the, our ability to detect the adjective uh, that appears in this gray se segment here. So like 250 to 400 milliseconds. So there is a significant difference between our ability to see the noun versus the adjective. It's easier to detect the noun versus the adjective during this early time point. And then we see some effects of condition um, that appear to be driven by either the list or the isolation context. So the next question I'm interested in asking is something about uh, the representation's uh, stability. So we have a particular um, we, we look at these curves and we might see, for example, in the list condition here, this early peak. Um, is this representation that we're leveraging based on the brain activity, um, does it have anything to do with the representation we see later in time? So that is, does, is the brain, whatever the brain is doing to represent the adjective here, is it doing the same thing to represent the adjective here as you're about to say it? And we can ask the same thing of the noun in the phrase condition, for example, like this early peak, is this representation for this early peak uh, consistent with, they say, this little last little blurb blip here? 
So is your brain doing the same thing early in time versus late in time? Or here, when we have this early peak for the noun in isolation, is that peak consistent with what's happening later in time as you're about to say the noun? So we ask, how stable are these representations in time? And in order to answer this, that question, we have to sort of break out of the typical analysis that we've been doing. So the typical analysis, what Rohan talked about as well as what I'm about to talk, I had talked about up until now, are training a model on a particular point in time using some window of meg data here, and then testing on that same window in time. And so those are all of the curves you've seen up until this point. So we're training and testing on the same window, but we can also um, train and test on different windows. And that's the time generalization or TGM uh, from King and Dehane in 2014, had a really nice review paper of this uh, methodology. So we train on a particular point in time, but now we can ask the question, does that pattern generalize in time? So we can test it on different points in time and check to see if the, we're still able to decode the identity of the word with above chance accuracy. So you can imagine that this idea can generalize to all possible training windows and all possible test windows. So if you did that, you would, um, if you produced all possible train and test windows, you would end up with a matrix where each one of the uh, points corresponds to the intersection of train and test. So here on the uh, y axis, I have train time. And here on the x axis, I have test time. This is actually for the, the paper that Rohan was just talking about with the adjective and noun uh, visual word stimuli. And so for a particular point in time, what I have is uh, a window centered here at two seconds that I use to train my model. And then I test that model with those beta weights at this other point in time here at one second. And so everything that you have seen up until now was this diagonal line. We were training and testing on exactly the same point in time. And so that corresponds to this diagonal line in this matrix. So that's the, yeah, what I was using the yellow line to uh, represent previously. And what we can do now instead is to look, for example, at a row of this uh, matrix. And that would correspond to training one model and testing on all possible time points. And so you might see a blip in time here where the train and test windows happen to overlap. And you may or may not see anything else uh, sort of as you move away from that particular point in time. So just to make clear, or try to make clear, um, there's two cases. So what we had seen up until now is always checking for a neural pattern at a particular time t and testing at that same pattern. So for to make the graphs you had seen up until this point, we had to train n different models and also test those each one of those models at the, the same window that it was uh, the data was selected to do the training. So there are n models trained for this graph and also in test time windows. Only one model trained. So here's the, the pictorial representation of the model. So these beta weights are trained one time for a particular window of time for a particular um, set of MEG data. And then we can test it on all of the possible points in time. So there's one model trained, one set of beta weights, and we apply that same model on all of the different test time windows. So we do that for every row of this matrix in order, order to create the entire matrix. So I, I have tried to explain this a few times in the past and failed uh, and found that there was a lot of uh, misunderstanding in the audience. So I would like to pause here and ask if anybody has any questions. Okay, I will start. Uh, is the matrix supposed to be symmetric uh, along the diagonal? So that's a great question. So. Um, you can imagine that if the noise properties were identical, then you might, ex you might expect it to be symmetrical, but training on different points in time um, will produce different models. And so it won't be perfectly symmetric. So training on two seconds and testing at one second is not going to be the same as training at one second and testing at two seconds. So we don't expect them to be symmetrical. And uh, it's not totally obvious here, but here this um, patch is mirrored to a And we'll see an example, actually, a very stark example in the results that I'll get to that where it's, sorry, did I cut it there? It said my 
Yes, it, it does seem to be uh, a little bit choppy. Um, okay, um, so you were saying we wouldn't expect it to be symmetric, uh, which we can appreciate by the graph as well. Um, maybe my follow-up question would be, could we leverage that asymmetry to answer the question about the stability that you generally opened with? Mm, that's an interesting question. So uh, in general, the way that we measure the stability is just the ability for a particular uh, um, model trained at a particular time to generalize to another time. Um, so here for this actual for this uh, paradigm, I'm not going to talk about this, but here we actually see like in a reemergence. So we'll go through a few hypothetical examples. That's an interesting idea that you could compare the two sides of the matrix to, to ask how stable it is. But for what I'll talk about today, what we test is um, whether a particular point of the matrix is above chance, statistically above chance, significantly. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions before we? So just as a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question and you're in the audience, um, I know it can feel like you're a passive observer, but please, you're not. I will see you if you raise your hand. Just keep it up and we'll get to you. So please use the raise hand function if you'd like to, to join. Okay, maybe I'll go through that. The, the King and Dehane paper has an, a few nice um, examples, hypothetical examples. So we'll go through them and I think that also helps to illustrate what's going on. So the, the idea here behind these, this figure is that we have some generators here and these are here, like to represent some sort of neural process that's going on. And so, and these colored bumps are the activity of those generators. So here there's some generator A followed by B followed by C. And so we see these bumps in time. Um, so if we were just looking at the graphs we've talked to up until this point, which is the diagonal decoding, where we train and test on the same window, we would see three bumps for this first example with the isolated generators. But we would have no idea if those bumps had anything to do with each other, if they were related at all. We just know that there are three detectable patterns at three different points in time here. They may or may not be the same pattern. We can't tell if we just look at the diagonal decoding. But if we look at the, the TGM, the, the matrix here, we can see that the three bumps ex exist along the diagonal, but there's nothing on the off diagonal, which would tell me that those, those processes had anything to do with each other. Um, if there's just one process A that's, that sort of turns on a particular point in time and then turns off, we would see uh, sort of like a, a square in time that corresponds to the, our ability to detect that particular generator. And if we had a whole bunch of processes sort of chained together that were uh, distinct and, and didn't overlap in their uh, neural signatures, we would see something along the diagonal that looks like this. Uh, so it's interesting to note that here, these two diagonal plots look very similar, actually these three, but their TGMs will be very different. And so here's an example that where something is reactivated. So we have some process A, B, C, and then we return to A again. And so we can see that here in the bumps, we have blue, red, green, blue. And our diagonal decode, decoding would just be high for the entire time point. But if we looked at a TGM, we would see something off diagonal because this first process, A, is repeated later in time, A. And so that's actually um, part of what was happening in these pictures here, that this, whatever process is happening here, it happens again later in time. But I'll refer you to the 2019 paper for that particular result. I think this really helps to clar clarify. Yeah. Okay, good. Great. Yes, the King of the Hain paper is really wonderful. You should, well, if you're interested, it's a great uh, paper and really the figures are so helpful. Um, so as you can imagine, these matrices are, can be very big. So 100, 100 uh, train times, 100 test times gives you 10,000 different comparisons. So we have to do some false discovery rate uh, corrections. So we do either the Benjamin Ucatelli or um, this cluster permutation test that's common for neuroimaging data. Okay, so let's talk about um, applying this uh, analysis procedure to our data. So remember that we have people naming the uh, pictures in the scanner. And so here in this, this is the list condition. We saw this interesting early bump in time as well as this ramping up towards the end of time for the adjective. So the question is, is this um, early bump, does it have a relationship to this late bump? So if it does not, we would expect to see something like this, except with only two bumps. We'll see an early bump, a late bump, and nothing 
on the off diagonal. But if there is a relationship between this early time period and the late time period, we will see something on the off diagonal like this reactivated example here. Okay, so um, this is the TGM for the adjectives in the list condition and there's nothing on the off diagonal. So we see that early bump and we see something late as you're about to say the adjective but there's nothing in the off diagonal. So whatever representation your brain is, whatever your brain is doing at this point in time, it doesn't appear to be related to what your brain is doing later in time. So this, what we think might be a function of the sort of artificial nature of this particular uh, condition, um, produces some sort of attentional mechanism here, something um, to do with the early perception of the adjective uh, background color that doesn't have anything to do with your planning of saying the adjective later in time. So we can also look, so this is the adjectives in the phrase condition, as well as in the list. Here's that, sorry, the list that we just talked about, as well as in isolation. So in isolation, when we saw that wrapping up towards uh, saying the, the adjective towards the end, that's, we see something that looks sort of like a, a square as we approach the um, onset of the speech. So there is some, a fairly stable representation as you sort of move towards saying the word. Um, when the adjective is part of a phrase, we get a little bit of early, above chance, but mostly it exists towards the end here as you're about to say the adjective. So in all, most of the cases we have this, um, as you're about to produce the adjective, um, we get this, uh, what is a more stable representation, but before that point in time, we see something that's very like the chain uh, that we saw in the King and Dehane examples. Uh, and I'm going to show you here, this This is the difference between these matrix. So if you take this matrix and subtract this one, you get this one, and there's no significant difference between the phrase and the list condition. There is a significant difference between the phrase and the, and the isolation condition for adjectives in that the isolation condition does produce higher accuracy towards the onset of the utterance. So this is a sort of our first uh, hint that there doesn't appear to be much difference for adjectives whether you're saying them in a phrase or, or a list because there's no significant difference in this uh, graph here. So now I'll talk about the nouns in the phrase in the list condition. So we saw um, this early, uh, well, from 100 to 400 milliseconds approximately um, representation of the adjective, uh, sorry, the noun here. So, um, the question is, is this a stable representation in time? So will we see something that looks like a square, meaning that the representation for the uh, noun sort of persists over time in a way that's fairly consistent? Or will we see something that looks like this chain? So we see something that's mostly along the diagonal. Um, so when we look at the phrase condition, we see a lot of off diagonal. And it's not a perfect square, but we do see something that's sort of like a square early in time, meaning that this early representation of the noun is fairly stable in time. And then it sort of turns into something that looks a bit more like a chain. We see less off diagonal later in time. So this early representation is pretty stable in time, but it sort of stops being stable as we move through time. We can compare that to the list condition where we see a really stark difference. So in the list condition, remember the stimuli is exactly the same and you're planning I still to say an adjective followed by a noun, but for some reason, preparing to say the noun in an actual compositional phrase context produces a representation that's much more stable than in the list context. So in the list context, we see something that looks a lot like the chain that in the Dehaene graphs. So meaning that there's some process that's representing the noun, but it's um, the representation in your brain is not very self-similar in time. And just like we did before, we can take the difference between these graphs, so the noun minus the list, and we see that there is actually a significant difference. Those opposites actually are significantly different between the two conditions. And then in, we see the noun in isolation. Um, again, we see that ramping up as you prepare to see the, say the noun. And remember here in the phrase condition, you're not preparing to say a noun, you're preparing to say the adjective. And so we see that there is a significant difference in that um, accuracy late in time, because in one case, you're preparing to say the noun, in one case, you're preparing to say the adjective. Good. So because we have people saying adjectives and nouns in, in the, each of these different contexts, we can also ask questions about um, what the representation looks like across contexts. And so here, this requires us to train and test not only in different time points, but also in different conditions. So here, these graphs are different in that 
this training time is taken from a particular condition C prime, and this training time is taken from a particular condition C. And here again, generalization here would be test time. So test time from a condition C and con test time condition C prime. So here on the diagonal is the graphs we've been looking at previously where C and C and C prime and C prime join. But here on the off diagonal, this is training on a particular condition, but then testing from data in a different, in another condition. So um, for example, like trying to decode the adjective during the phrase versus the list um, would be an example. And so depending on the pattern, we can, we'll see different uh, things pop up in these graphs. So if there is a very similar process going on, um, meet in here the example is just that one is sort of like more strong than the other. This is the, what we would, we would expect to see something that um, is a, a square-like thing, but possibly less uh, bright in our uh, accuracy scale. And then I wanted to point out this one, um, if we have a difference in latency, so here there's like a chain of processes um, that are occurring and that's why for here training and testing on the same point in time we get that chain along the diagonal. And here also there's a there's a chain of processes we get a chain along the diagonal. And those processes are a match to each other but for this condition C prime the first three processes take longer. They are, exist, they are happening for longer and so that's why we get these bigger X's along the diagonal here. And so when we do cross condition, because these are the same processes, we will get matches, but because there's differences in latency, that's what pushes this line off of the diagonal. So there's, there is a match between the processes, but we can see that here C prime, uh, the, the later processes are delayed in time, so we see them off the diagonal. Oh, that's very interesting with these off diagonal, uh, yeah, diagonal. <laughs> Uh, trace of the ones that are the same, right, just the same duration but different latency. I feel like in, in some of the earlier plots that you were showing where things look like a square, maybe there were some kind of streaks or, or maybe I'm not remembering the, the right plot, but I guess I, I thought back then that I saw something that reminded me of, of these off diagonal diagonal streaks. Does that make yeah. sense? Especially in the 2019 matrices that I'm not talking about, there are off diagonal streaks that are, um, I think, interesting, although uh, unexplained in that um, paper. I see. But we're, as you might imagine, I'm explaining it here because we're going to see something that looks a little bit like this streak right. off diagonal. Okay. Okay. Other questions? Uh, no. Uh, okay, so the question is, is the representation for an adjective or a noun different depending on the context you see the uh, word in? So depending on the condition um, that you're in when you see the picture that causes you to produce either the adjective or the noun or the adjective noun uh, list or phrase. And so the first one we'll talk about is nouns. So here um, we're training in both of these cases, both of these cases, we're training in isolation. We're going to test in the phrase and test in the list. And so here we see a lot of on diagonal, meaning whatever's happening in isolation is similar to what's happening in the phrase condition. And it happens at the same time. But then we also see this sort of sneaking off of the diagonal here, um, which tells us that there's something uh, going on that's delayed in time. And um, it actually um, sort of appears to extend itself down here. Uh, and it's interesting because this delay here is 100 milliseconds, which is actually the same as what I had seen in the 2019 um, paper. So I think I don't have an answer right now for why there is this 100 millisecond delay appearing uh, both here as well as in what I had seen previously. Um, but I think it could have something to do with um, the oscillations in the brain uh, impacting the representations and how they uh, can be detected across time. Um, but there's, there's lots to be uh, sort of explored there still. But what we can see here is that, so training the, the noun in isolation looks a lot like the noun in the phrase. Um, and there is also this sort of repetition in time. And that's interesting because a noun in isolation, a noun by itself actually is a valid phrase, right? So if I say lamp, lamp is a phrase, uh, a noun phrase onto, un, onto itself as is white lamp. Uh, so in both those cases, the noun is participating in a phrase. And so it, there's an overlap in the representations that we have in those two conditions. But here in the list condition, because it's a bit of an artificial condition and the, the noun is not really participating in a, um, 
sort of a the typical kind of phrase you would think of is maybe like a phrase within a list or something. We don't see the same shared representation across the two ta tasks. Um, and this is a pretty stark difference for these two graphs. Um, we can do the same thing for adjectives. So we're going to train in isolation as well as test in the phrase. Um, so remember that when we're training in, when in the isolation case as well as the phrase um, case, we're saying the adjective is the first thing we're saying as we uh, approach the onset of this, this speech. And so there's an overlap there in the isolation and the uh, phrase uh, sort of as we get later in time. We, we see a bit of that in the uh, training and isolation testing list, but again, it's, it's much decreased. So there's something about planning to say the adjective in this list condition that doesn't match as well as planning to say it in a condition that's by itself. I also wanted to point out, remember in the list condition, we saw that early peak uh, that had to do, we thought had to do with the ping's particular attention to the background color, uh, something to do with like the additional cognitive processing required there. Whatever that is happening early in time in the list condition, it doesn't appear to match what happens early in time in, in isolation. So that, that peak, not only does it not match itself later in time in the list condition, it also doesn't ma match the early time period for uh, the isolation condition. So the list condition appears to be very, very different. So there, although um, when we looked at the single graphs in time, what would be the diagonal here? When we looked at the single graphs in time, it seemed like phrases and lists looked very similar. They were above chance. Nouns were above chance at very similar times. And there wasn't actually a significant difference between those two conditions. We actually do see really strong differences when we talk about the nouns in um, the difference between nouns and phrases and lists. There is a, a strong difference, but we had to look at the TGMs in order to see it. So it's an, a good example of how looking at your data in different ways uh, can allow you to see things that you wouldn't normally see. Good, so just to wrap up, I think I'm almost out of time. <clears throat> uh, so we, the first thing we showed here was that we can see the word you're planning to say before you say it. Um, and so that is, an, an, I think, a new result and of interest, uh, especially here in this uh, picture naming paradigm. Uh, the noun representation is really strong early in the trial from 100 to 400 milliseconds. Um, it's just, and that is a sustained representation in the phrase context, remember, because we saw the off diagonal in the TGM. Um, and it looks like the phrase and isolation representations are a pretty good match for the noun. And so we also saw that as we prepare to say a word, we're able to see the representation for that word type ramping up. So as you prepare to say either the adjective in the three conditions where the adjective's first or the noun in the one condition where the noun is first, uh, we can see the representation for that word ramping up towards the end as you're about to say it. Uh, good, so I think this opens up questions about um, how the different representations change as a function of what we're planning to do with them. And um, it's interesting to see that there's so much overlap between the isolation noun condition and the phrase where there's there's a sort of a over considered to be the linguistic units there. Um, and also, I think the delay of 100 milliseconds is also of interest and something I'd like to look into in the future. <clears throat>